You're listening to The Virtuous Mind, a podcast from Providence Christian College that discusses all facets of the human experience and the liberal arts from a biblical worldview. I'm your host, Dr. David E. Alexander. What are you afraid of? What scares you so much that it paralyzes you to even think about it? Could it be a fear of heights? Or of flying? Perhaps it is a trepidation around spiders or snakes. Believe it or not, some studies have shown that the greatest fear humans experience, even greater than a fear of death, is a fear of performing in public. Whether delivering a lecture, playing an instrument, or engaging in some other form of artistic expression, most of us have experienced the distress and agony often referred to as performance anxiety. But what is performance anxiety? And what does performance anxiety really say about us? More importantly, what does such a fear say about our faith and trust in God? In this episode of The Virtuous Mind, I'm joined by Professor Madeline Polare, lecturer in music at Providence Christian College. Together, Madeline and I explore performance anxiety from a biblical worldview, focusing on three things that such anxiety can reveal about us. The actual object of our worship, our perception of ourselves and where our value and worth come from, and ultimately, our understanding of God and His providence. Madeline, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, David. My guess is that many of the people listening to this can relate. How should we define performance anxiety? What are some of the telltale signs? And then I'm curious to think about different approaches to dealing with it. I can imagine at least certain principles from Scripture might conflict with the current approach to dealing with this very widespread phenomena. What are the approaches that maybe those outside of Christianity might recommend to dealing with it? The nice thing, if there is a nice thing about performance anxiety, is that everyone knows what it is. Mm. We all experience it in some way or another. And its symptoms are both physical and psychological as a result of fear of some high-pressured performance. And Mm. I think to put it simply, David, performance anxiety is a type of focused fear, focused on a specific event or a specific context. Luckily for us, the Bible talks a lot about fear. But if you were to Google cures for performance anxiety, you get a lot of things like take deep breaths, don't drink caffeine, make sure you practice extra. You'll even get cures that say believe in yourself, yeah, yeah, which is a huge message that the world has for us. And things like take deep breaths, don't drink caffeine, get good sleep, those are good tips. Making sure you're well rested and physically caring for your body is always a good idea and it helps significantly. And the verse that I think we bring up a lot is 1 Kings 19 when Elijah experienced anxiety so bad he actually asked God to kill him, which was a performance anxiety. He was anxious because his prophecies weren't being received well and he was being threatened. And what happened next was he took a nap and then God told him to eat. So there is biblical wisdom Mm. in making sure we're rested and nourishing our bodies. There's something to be said about the importance of rest in the face of fear, but those solutions don't get to the root of the issue. I think the place to start is addressing our theology. Mm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Pastor Paul David Tripp. Oh, yeah. I love, love his material. He talks about the difference between theology that we believe in academically versus the street level functioning theology that takes place in our lives. Your actions and your attitudes actually are greater indicator of the theology that you truly believe than what you say is. At the end of the day, we could dismiss like, I had a high stress situation, I was having a bad day, I'm cranky. But if God was really the ruler of my heart and my theology was in the right place, then I would have been patient and kind and loving no matter the circumstances. Mm. And that's where we can see theology taking place. And so I think the root of the issue really, and this is not going to be a popular answer, but that performance anxiety comes from sin. 
Mm. Practically speaking, everyone struggles with performance anxiety in some way or another. We have important things we don't want to fail at. And it can be comforting as we wrestle through performance anxiety, but that's not enough to cure us. It comes from a result of errant theology and sinful attitudes. But once we recognize that the sin is there, the beautiful part comes that we get to grow by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. I think when it comes to treating anxiety, how the Bible would have us treat anxiety, specifically performance anxiety, but even anxiety in general, there's three questions we can ask ourselves. Who do we worship? Where do we put our identity? And finally, what do we believe about providence? Mm. So that question, who do you worship? For being Christians, the answer is not often God if we're looking at that street theology, how we're living, right? Our fears and resulting actions reveal our worship and only a good tree can bear good fruit. When we become anxious, it reveals to us where we really place our trust and desires. Personally, I've spent much of my life seeking the approval of others, which has led to some amazing opportunities, but miserable circumstances. I would go so far to say is I'm afraid of what people think because I worship them over God. Mm, And I become a slave to what they think. And that leads to when I'm performing, I'm constantly worried about what is so-and-so going to say? Oh, I see so-and-so in the audience. What do they think of me today? Because I've exalted to them to a place above where God is. When we surrender to performance anxiety, we're worshiping something else above ourselves. We're actually giving glory that is due to God. We become glory robbers in that moment. What we're worshiping will actually determine the joy that comes out of the situation that Mm, we put ourselves mm. in. Because we're robbing not just God of the glory, but we're robbing ourselves of the opportunity to use it as a worshipful act. I think the Bible offers a clear solution when it comes to treating this fear of who do we worship. And the answer actually can be found back in 1 Kings 19, that story with Elijah where he goes and he has to take a nap and he has to eat. What cured him from his fear wasn't the nap and the snack. How God responded to Elijah in that moment was by bringing him to himself. That was the moment that God appeared to Elijah in the form of a still small voice. And Jesus actually talks a little bit about being afraid of man in ministry. And in Matthew 10, 28, he says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So when you're experiencing that performance anxiety, you have to ask yourself, who am I afraid of? The answer to that question will indicate to you who you're worshiping at that moment. Because Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? So that's the first step is to come to God, be in his word and say, God, I'm struggling. I'm worshiping man more than I'm worshiping you right now. I'm afraid of what others think of me. Show me yourself. Show me your character. Will you bring me to a point where I am more enamored with you than I am with whoever is in my audience. That's the first cure that the Bible offers us. But then we come to that second question of where is your identity? And that's a principle that I really try to encourage with the students here at Providence. The choir students have definitely heard me say this. A lot of performance anxiety speaks to where we put our identity. We're not only worshiping other people, but now we're actually telling ourselves that our value is attached to the action that we're doing. Mm. You know those people who always seem confident and never nervous? Those people blow my mind. And if they're not faking it, I can guarantee it's because they don't put their identity or worth in what they do. Yeah. And as Christians, we need to take this a step further. If my theology is correct on the practical level, then my worth is going to be found in my identity as a child of God. And what other people think of me won't be a plague to me because A, I worship God more and B, I know what he thinks of me. That verse Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's actually referring to in that whole section how we're predestined in Christ. Mm. It's saying if God has called us and personally secured us through his son, then it's game over. Your identity is in him and nothing can stand against you because nothing can stand against the living God. So I think we spend a lot of time wondering what others think of us. And that's why performance anxiety is so crippling is because we tell ourselves what they think of us determines who I am. But what scripture says is that what God thinks of us determines who we are. The fact that God is a sovereign God that has relevance in thinking about our performances in front of others. Okay, how so? How does that help us? I titled this question, What Does Providence Have to Do With It? I hope you liked my little play on words there. Love it. 
I want to point your listeners to Psalm 23, but particularly the opening lines. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mm. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. As a musician and someone who is regularly performing on stage for various audiences, it is still so easy to be nervous and wonder if I'm good enough or if I will fail. Yet something that brings me immense comfort is resting in the sovereignty of God. If he really is my good shepherd, then that means that wherever I am, even if I'm on stage and failing at my performance, wherever I am is exactly the greenest pasture and the stillest waters. Mm. He will even use my failures for good when I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. To be vulnerable with you, David, when I first started here at Providence, I struggled with a lot of fear and insecurity. And the part of me that put my identity in music was on high alert, just Mm. waiting for someone to call me out on every single mistake I made. But by his grace, God brought a hugely comforting thought to mind. There are certainly other musicians out there who are more amazing and can do a better job than I will ever do. But of all the musicians that God could have chosen, my sovereign God, he put me here. Wow. That means I'm not Mm. serving the people in my audience. I'm serving my God. So I'll do my best. And if I nail it, praise God, that's to his glory. And if I fail, that's also to his glory because of all the hands to touch the piano that is in front of me or all the voices to be lifted to the microphone, he chose mine. And that brings so much peace because my calling is not to the approval of my audience, but to the approval of my God. And I know that he's sovereign over my failures, which doesn't give us an excuse to slack off, right? I think a lot of people would go, well, God is sovereign. So Mm, if I make a mistake, that was in his will. And that's not truth either. There's definitely a human responsibility aspect there. But if anything, it should motivate us to work harder and to do better because what we're doing becomes a gift yeah. to God yeah. and a privilege, not because we're worthy to be the one doing what we're doing, but because for whatever reason, in that moment, we become his servant. Mm. I think of the funerals that I've gotten to play piano for. And in that moment, my hands are the hands of Jesus serving his saints as they mourn the loss mm. of a loved one. Even if you're doing a test, and you're nervous about a test, right? That can be to the glory of God as well. And so for the Christian, no failure is a real failure because we believe that God is sovereign over our failures and he promises to work for good. So it means that I don't have to stress and over-prepare. I don't have to pull my hair out every time I have some high-pressured performance. And I certainly don't have to take my frustration out on others because no matter what happens, I'll be okay. I think of how Moses, when God called him, one of his first responses, but God, I have a stutter. Or they think he was saying, God, I have a stutter. I don't have a way with words. And God's response was essentially, that doesn't matter. I'm calling you. Yeah. Right? It also minimizes his power because how little faith we have if we don't think God can use us or grow us to be exactly what he needs. We think so little of God that he can make mistakes by putting us in those situations. But God doesn't make mistakes. Even if it's our failure, God doesn't make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Part of what you're saying is, you know, we got to be honest about who we really are and who God really is and what he's doing, what he's up to. That sounds like another way of referencing humility. So what's the role of humility in these experiences of anxiety, of performance anxiety in particular? That's a great question. I think humility takes place first in being able to accept failure. I don't know if you're familiar with Angela Duckworth. She's a secular psychologist. She's amazing. Her book, Grit. Yep. Phenomenal book. She conducted thousands of studies to see what makes people stick it out. And one of the things she found was that growth mindset. If that's the secular world, being able to accept failures as an opportunity for growth How much more for Christians? I think we need to stop looking at failures as a sort of death because Mm. that's pride talking. We say, because I'm sovereign in my life, the end all be all is my failure. But if we see God is sovereign in our life, we take that humble standpoint. We see failure as rebirth, an opportunity to grow, and an opportunity to rest in the success of Jesus on our behalf Mm. and an opportunity to dwell in our God's faithfulness. 
Failure no longer becomes about me. Failure becomes I get to rest in my God. And I know that Jesus lived the perfect life on my behalf because, quite frankly, I never could. Scripture talks very clearly about how humility actually, in the end, turns around to exalt us. The verse that comes to mind is 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, which says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so at the proper time he may exalt Mm. you. Casting your anxieties. Key word because we're talking about anxiety here. That's exactly what this is talking about. Casting your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So when we humble ourselves, not just to God, but we're humbling ourselves to one another, we're going to find success in our failures and we're going to find peace in our performances. Fascinating. Before we wrap up our time, I definitely want to hear from you some practical advice. I'm getting ready to go out and uh, speak to 300 people, 400 people, whatever. You know, I've prepared, I've, I've done my due diligence, but nevertheless, I am experiencing the sweaty palms, heart rate, dilated pupils, all of the telltale signs of fear and anxiety are present. What's some practical advice you can give us on dealing with that? performance anxiety is a heart issue. But what scripture offers is a lot of soul solutions because scripture says a lot about fear. As my husband often reminds me, the commandment given the most in scripture is be not afraid. Mm. And so even though this is not a quick solution, it's a lasting and it's a God honoring one and it takes practice. So I encourage for practical steps, meditate on Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I think here it outlines the perfect practical steps. Next time you're nervous, you're about to speak in front of 300 people. First, worship God by praying and casting your cares on him. Because like we said in 1 Peter 5, he cares for you. Mm. But I want to make sure that we don't miss two of the most crucial and revealing words in the Philippians passage. I think this is maybe one of the most practical steps that isn't talked about enough. And that's the two words with thanksgiving. Yep, yep, yep. When you're preparing for a high-pressured event, are you being thankful? Are you thanking God for where he has you, for his sovereignty? You can't thank God without acknowledging his sovereignty. That takes humility. That's that moment of saying, God, I trust you. God, thank you for how you have me here. Thank you for this opportunity that you've put in front of me. Thank you that there's a better speaker out there, a better pianist out there, but you put me here. Mm. That's actively placing your trust and your joy in Christ and not in your situation. And then finally, making sure we're meditating in each moment on what's admirable and lovely, like our identity being in him. Write it out if you have to. Praying with friends and asking for accountability is another great way to make sure you're fixing your mind on the right things. Putting off those thoughts of I'm not enough and I'm going to fail my performance today. I'm going to fail this test today and putting on thoughts of I'm a child of God. I'm safe and secure in him. That's the practice. The practice doesn't take place in, you know, getting a good night's sleep, making sure you eat a whole meal with 60% carbs and 30% protein, whatever that looks like for you. The practical step is capturing those thoughts, even writing them out and going, okay, I'm going to put off fear and I'm going to put on Thanksgiving Mm. and I'm going to put on whatever's true and lovely and admirable and using accountability as a way to do that. For me, it's been such a joy to share with my life group this last year. I'll ask them to pray, hey, I have a performance coming up. Maybe I'm playing piano for a wedding. I'm really nervous about it. Will you be praying? And then to be able to come back and say, guys, God answered prayer. I felt supernaturally not nervous Mm -hmm. or I played the best I've ever played. And that gives glory to God. And I'm practicing putting off and not just putting off, but then reminding myself of his faithfulness, reminding myself of what he's done for me so that by the next performance, my trust in God has grown and I'm more practiced in fighting fear than I was. 
was before. Beautiful, beautiful advice. I know there's a number of things that you've read, and I want to give you an opportunity to direct our audience to some resources. You know, you're a performer by profession. You probably are going to be way more familiar with the literature on this than most all of us are. So give us some reading that we might be able to benefit from that has definitely benefited you. Some of the resources that have really blessed me are amazing counselors and teachers like Dr. Greg Gifford has a great book called Heart and Habits, which talks about how your habits will transform your heart. So building those healthy habits. Trusting God by Jerry Bridges talks about putting your place in the Lord. Probably my favorite book on the topic is When People Are Big and God is Small by Ed Welch. There's not a single person in the world that it won't apply to. Mm. We all struggle with fear of man. And for some people, that looks like performance anxiety. And And for some people, that looks like people pleasing. And then the Paul Tripp podcast and his book, New Morning Mercies, really just has what we talked about, practice and meditating on scripture. It's that practical every day. Are you bringing yourself to God? Are you placing your identity in God? Because once you start doing that as a habit, that will continue to bring you before him so that when you're in those high pressured moments, it's not the big moments that define you. It's the little moments and how you prepared for that. And then I just wanted to point out to your listeners this thought. History's greatest failure and greatest moment of what could have been the greatest performance anxiety, the greatest, most crucial performance was also its ultimate saving good on Mm. the cross. That Jesus was faced with the opportunity for fear. And history looks at Jesus' death and the people surrounding Jesus looked at his death and said, that's a failure. That's someone who performed and failed. And yet it's because of that God used that for our good. And Christ walked by placing his faith in God, by continually being at the feet of the Father and humbling himself before God. And I think that's the example that we look to as we handle our performances, as we handle those moments that clearly are not as important as the moment was on the cross. You've been listening to The Virtuous Mind, a podcast from Providence Christian College. The mission of Providence Christian College as a reformed Christian institution is to equip students to be firmly grounded in biblical truth, thoroughly educated in the liberal arts, and fully engaged in their church, their community, and the world for the glory of God and for service to humanity. We'd love to have you visit our campus. Providence Christian College is now accepting applications for the upcoming semester. Contact an admissions counselor to learn more. Visit providencecc.edu.